John 3 and 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure. Okay, well, let me ask you this. If God doesn't give the spirit by measure, who limits the spirit? How come churches all across America aren't receiving powerful Holy Ghost spirit-filled services? If God does not limit the spirit, who does? Us, the people. It's plain and simple. And what God is wanting people to do is not limit the spirit. I felt in my spirit is what was coming up here. My wife said, well, Joe, what do you feel in your heart about this church? I said, baby, this is a revival church. They may not be in a full-blown extended revival, but it's going to be offered to them. I'm just going to be prophetic and speak it out. I feel like this is a church that, that God is given an open opportunity to see the Lord move in mighty ways. And as I started praying for this church, I just see this church filled up. I, I love how your church, you decided to build a sanctuary about two to three times bigger than your congregation. Now, that's a vision right there, but it's not big enough. All right? The Lord is good. Let's get into the Word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this night. Lord, I want to pray for the pastors of this church, Lord. I pray that you give them strength. You give them vision. And God, however much vision they have, you will meet that with finances and you will meet that with workers. Lord, I know that you always give the people just, you give them what they need, God. And I just know inside of this church tonight, there are the people that they need to do what the kingdom of God has called them to. So Lord, I pray that the workers arise tonight in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. My grandmother one day gave me a dictionary and told me to look up some of my favorite words. Now, this is an old school dictionary. This is not a new trendy dictionary that waters a lot of definitions down. If you look at a dictionary written in the 17 or 1800s, one thing that you will find is so many words that we commonly use in the English language have God attached to them. It's, it's amazing. Like the word destiny. It means invincible necessity. What does the word invincible mean? Incapable of being conquered, defeated, or subdued. There means nothing. If something is invincible, it cannot be beat. The word necessity means this, that it must happen. So the destiny that God has placed in and on your life, it means it cannot be destroyed and it must happen. See, what happened is for, from a generation, we'll say three generations, two generations older than me, 65% of that generation in America claimed to be believers. Two generations ago, it, was, it dropped down to 35%. Then, then the generation just barely over me is 15%. And the generation a little bit younger than me is only 4%. Did you know that my children's generation is, is predicted to have less than 2% of believers in America when they get to be 18 or over? Did you know that is considered a lost people group? America is on the verge of being a lost people group to where nations of the world are going to start sending missionaries over to America because we're not doing what the Lord has called us to do. Because people are not waking up and being who God has completely called them to do, to be. Amen? But I want you to think about something. There's a ministry that I really like in, in Hamilton, Alabama called The Ramp. A lady who is an international Christian singer sold her jet, gave up that part of her ministry, and took on a youth group of seven kids. And now they have a ramp that if you go to their conference, they have to shut it off at 1,000 in a very small, subdued town in Alabama. Why? Because a woman got together with seven kids and started praying and believing for God to shake a region. Their winter conference had 7,000 people two years ago in a small city where a woman got a burden and a vision and some people started praying. I, I love the story about IHOP. They said they started with about eight young people. And these eight young people started praying. Two years ago at New Year's, they had 25,000 people show up to an event that started with just a handful of people praying. There's so many movements of God that it started with just a handful of people that got together and said, hey, I will pray and I will believe for something to happen. I just really believe that there's some people in here that can happen for if they stand up and do what God has called them to do. You know, in Jeremiah 1 and 5, it says, Before I shaped you in your mother's womb, I knew all about you. And before you saw the light of day, I had a holy plan for you, a prophet unto the nation. There are so many people in here that God has put something inside of you. And let me tell you how you know if you're walking in your destiny. Whenever everybody goes to bed in, in, at your house at night, if you lay there and look at the ceiling and you say this, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to life. See, I have a, a very 
very bad sleeping problem. I can't sleep. It's called revelation. And when I sit there laying, my mind starts spinning about, I have a revelation. How can I win somebody else to the Lord? How can see my, my wife and I, we feel we're called to revival. We're called to preach revival. We're, we're called to live revival. We're called to raise up three real little revivalists. I get my boy's two. He has a microphone. And he runs around the house with it on his chin like this. He knows how to hold it. And he's walking around the house with the microphone. My kids, they say, they were playing the other day in, the, in the room. And I walked in the room. I said, what are y'all doing? We're playing revival. Well, what are you doing? Dad, okay, this is where theology gets off in my house. They had all their American Girl dolls and all the Barbie dolls out. And they were praying for them. They were preaching to them. One led worship. Her name is Judah, which means praise. So she was leading worship. And, and Malachi, which means, you know, God's messenger, she was the one preaching. And they said they all got saved. And they all got filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the theology problem is this. When they say they got to be water baptized, I said, no, 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 no. Daddy paid for those dolls. We're not getting them water baptized. But when my kids play, they play revival. And they say, Dad, just can you feel the power of God in here? I'm like, yeah, baby, it's great. They start bringing the teddy bears in because revival's growing. And they start bringing all their different animals in. That's what they want to do, see God move. So, th so they practice it out with their animals and, and their, their dolls. They're excited about the house of the Lord. Are you excited about the house of God? Man, the Lord is so good. The Lord is good. In James 4 and 8, I said this earlier. If we draw near to God, He's going to draw near to us. And this is what the Lord is wanting us to do. A generation, a group of people who will draw near to God. People will draw near near to him. I love preaching on this because some people are already checking out. You're going to be okay. You know, when you start drawing near to God, He's going to draw near to you. Man, the Lord is so good. It says in Hebrews 1 and 7, it says, and the angel, with the angel, he says this, he who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. If you are going to be a minister, you are going to be a flame of fire. You know, I had some pastors say, well, well, how do you get revival? And how do you get, how do you get the, the church to get on fire for God? And I was preaching at a, a meeting one time with a lot of pastors, and this is what I told them. I said, if you came on a Sunday morning and you lit your pulpit on fire, you know, if you let your pulpit on fire, you know what would happen? He said, everybody would come back on Sunday night to see what was going to happen. But see, if us, we're all the ministers, if we're on fire, people are going to come back. And what I always like to tell people, if the man of God with your pastor is on fire, your worship team's on fire, and we're all flames of fire, this church will feel up. Why is that? Because people are ready to watch people to burn. Why was Moses so intrigued by the burning bush? Because it was on fire and the fire never went out. The Bible says in Leviticus that when God would send his fire upon the altar, that every time God sent his fire down at different times in the Bible, the fires on the altar were never to go out. But what happened is Israel, if you read the Bible, it, they would go up and they were doing good and they would go down. And then they would go up and then they would become in bondage to somebody else. They would go up, they would go down. But what God wants us to do is continually go up. Amen. The Lord is good. Luke 4 and 18. Wait a minute. Let me change that. Hebrews 11 and 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he will reward those that diligently seek him. I'm going to talk about the diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. It just doesn't mean halfway passively seek him. The Greek word for diligently seek him is exito. This is what it means. This word carries out a wide range of a power packed meaning. It means to zealously seek him with everything you have, with all of one's heart, with all of one's might, and all of one's strength. It's talking about with everything that you have. Now imagine this, if you got everything in your life and you pointed it towards one direction, your time, your energy, your money, your efforts, and you pointed it straight to seeking the face of God for all that he had for you, what do you think you could accomplish? What do you honestly think you could accomplish? When's the last time you walked into a restaurant and people go, whew, wow, what's different about you? It's that presence of God. Because when, you, when you've been in the presence, people can tell and people are changed. See, what happens is in this I, just mentality that we have, some people, you just care about yourself. But think about Jesus. The word Christian means Christ-like. Did you know Christian is only mentioned three times in the Bible and two of it, was when people were calling them Christians. See, we're not supposed to call ourselves Christians. The world's supposed to call it, you must be a Christian because you act like the Christ that I read in the Bible. That's when the world will call you a Christian. Everybody is professing to be a Christian. If you profess to be a Christian, it means that somebody else isn't calling you one. You should never have to call yourself that. 
Amen. Luke 4 and 18, it says, For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me. You know, if you say that, you know who me is? That's right, it's you. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Who did he send? Pastor Sullivan? No, he's not going to send Pastor Sullivan to your work. He's going to send you. You know, at your family reunion, you got crazy Aunt Helen. He's not going to send Sister Sullivan. He's, he's going to send you to pray for her. And that's what God has called us to do, to heal the brokenhearted. And it says to proclaim the liberty of the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of, year of the Lord. This is what, what the Lord has called us to. But sometimes well, what happens to us is we, we, give, we give into the flesh. And let me tell you a story in the Bible. I love this story. Genesis 25, 29 through 34. This is about Esau selling his birthright. It says, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with some of that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore, his name is Edom. And Jacob said, show me your birthright as of this day. But Esau said, look, man, I'm about to die, brother. What does this birthright mean to me? And Jacob said, swear it to me. So Esau gave his birthright to Jacob. Now, let me explain this. Let's say that you had four sons and you were going to give them all your inheritance, okay? The oldest son got a double portion. So he got 40% and the other three brothers only got 20%. But the older brother also got to pick which 40% of his dad's inheritance he got. So Esau had all of this. Plus, he got to be the head priest over the family. He came in from hunting one day, and this is what he said. I will give you all of my 40% and everything that I have for one bowl of lentil stew. First of all, have you ever seen a lentil? Have you ever had a lentil? You think grits are bad. Have a lentil. He gave everything he had for one bowl of, of stew, and then he took the bowl, and then he was like, I gave everything I had for this. And you may laugh and you may think that's silly, but sometimes you will look at one computer screen and give away everything that you have. You will go too far with somebody and give everything you had. I had a, I had a guy one time say, man, I, I just keep driving by the liquor store, Joe, and I can't quit driving by. And this is crazy because Texas, where, where we lived, is dry. He worked in Texas and he lived in Texas. But Arkansas is wet. And I'm like, well, how do you go home? Right here is where he works. Right here is where he lived. Here's Arkansas. He went the long way around. And I said, brother, you're going out of your way to sin. And he would give away and he would drink a few and then he would go home to his wife and kids and be intoxicated. No, no, no. We are giving away things. We're giving away our birthright, our inheritance, everything that God gave us for one simple pleasure of the world that might only last for a moment. And then everything that we've worked for, it, it was given away. Now, here's the thing about Esau. Who is he supposed to pass everything on to? his kids, because of his selfish sin, everything that his kids were supposed to inherit, he gave away. Because my one little simple sin in my life means more to me than any of my kids. I would rather have this one bowl of stew than my wife be blessed, than my children be blessed, than my grandchildren be blessed, because I am so selfish. Y'all hearing this? Did you know what? When you go to work sometimes, when you're out on the highways and the byways, when you're on, on, on the, the hunting lease, there are people that you're going to see that are giving their bowl away. They are giving everything away. And that's when God is going to call you to step in and say, brother, you're, you're worth more than this. See, there's a lot of people that they've never had anybody tell them you're worth more than this. Young lady, you're worth so much more than to allow somebody to do what you're letting them do to just for a moment of pleasure for somebody gratifying you with words. You know, you are worth so much more than this. And if you, you look at Hebrews 12 and 15, it says, look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest anyone root of bitterness spring up and that cause trouble. And by this, they may be defiled, lest any beanie fornicator or profane person like Esau who gave away one morsel of food to sell his birthright. See, the thing about it was, is Esau, the, the Bible says that a beanie fornicator, he gave, he gave it away because it means he's a fornicator, right? He, gave, he was a fornicator, which means he wasn't walking with God. You know what the word Jacob means? Jacob, it means a deceiver. See, what happened is when you're not walking with God, anybody can deceive you. But if Esau would have been walking with God, he would have had the spirit of discernment on him and when Jacob would have came up to him, he said, you know, I just don't feel right in my spirit about that. Because here's what happened when Esau walked up 
to, and Jacob was cooking, he could have walked just a little bit further into his father's house. And then, and then his father, they would have been cooking because they had people that worked for him that cooked. But he gave into the first thing that came along because he wasn't walking with God, because he was a fornicator, because he stepped away from the things of the Lord. And so many times in our life, what we do is when we're not serving God, we don't have discernment, the spirit of God living within us. We'll let anybody deceive us. Amen. A few people with me. Good. It's going to be good tonight. I'm going to tell you a quick story about walking with God and hearing God. So when you walk with God and you hear God, it's not for you, it's for others. A, a while, a long time ago, about 16 years ago, I was in a prayer meeting and I was single and, and I had an angelic vision. I was in there praying and an angel walked in the door. Prettiest girl I've ever seen before in my life. And I thought, oh my gosh, Lord, I've never seen anybody that beautiful. And I looked real good. I had good eyesight back then. She didn't have a ring on her finger. I said, God, could she be the one? And um, so it, it was, now it's my wife. But I saw her and I was just so excited about her. And we started talking and we started courting. And just to let you young people know, I never touched my wife before we got married ever. You know, you know, the, the good story behind that, because when my kids asked me one day, dad, did you and mom ever do anything, you know, physically before you got married? No. When my grandkids asked me, Hey, did you ever do anything to grandma before you got married? No, I never touched her because I respected God who sent her to me. First of all, because the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. And we have that legacy forever. So young people are like, man, let me talking about that. So, but what the th thing about is this, is my wife walked in and we started building a relationship. So one of the first times that my future mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law came to hear me preach was at a very traditional church that did not believe in the Shondai. So what we were sitting there and, and I was getting ready to preach and it was seriously during the day, it was 104 heat to the wave. And I was sitting there and I got ready to speak, preach and the Lord said, I want you to speak on the Holy Spirit with the, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I'm like, Lord, I know you're smart, God, but see the sign out here? This church where I'm at, God, I've been asked to preach at is not one of those churches. God, give me some break. So, and the Lord said, no, you're going to preach on the, the Holy Spirit with the, bat, you know, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I said, okay, God, this is awesome. I'm preaching a traditional church. They don't believe in this. My future mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law are sitting here. Oh, goodness. So I get ready to preach. And I walk up. It's an outdoor camp meeting. I walk up to preach, and there was a man in a wheelchair and the Lord spoke to me and said this, before you preach, he will get up and walk. Okay, one more time. God, so we get this straight. I'm in a traditional church. They don't believe in healing. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit's for today. Okay, and right then and there, I had to make a, a decision. Am I going to walk with God and do exactly what he calls me to do? So I said, hey, excuse me, traditional people that don't believe in any of this. Um, I know I'm a guest. I don't know anybody. But, sir, I'm just going to tell you, the Lord said you're going to walk before I preach. And he said, sir, and called me a name. And it wasn't sanctified yet. And he said, I'm in a wheelchair for a reason. So I walk down here and I walk over here to this guy and I start praying for him. And everybody's looking at me like, like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? And I'm thinking, I don't know, because I'm only 21 years old. And so I'm sitting there and praying for this guy. And then I ask him to stand up and walk. And he, again, he said, I'm in a wheelchair for a reason because I can't walk. I said, I can see that, but tell God because he won't leave me alone till you walk. And so uh, I get down and I start praying and pleading. Look, dude, just try, please. I want to get married, okay? I'm engaged. I'm getting married in six months. So I sit down there and pray with them. So what do you do? The youth group's always on fire for God. So I call the kids and they're in a traditional church that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. They said, hey, how do you pray for somebody in a wheelchair? I said, dear God, we need an intervention. So I'm sitting there praying for him and the guy stands up or tries to help him up and he, he, he falls down to a knee. And I'm like, oh Jesus, I must want to make it out here alive, you know? And um, so I'm sitting there praying for him. We pray for about five minutes in the Texas heat. And I'm looking at my future wife-to-be and she's looking at me like, Oh no, have I messed up? Then I look at my mother-in-law to be, and she's really looking at me like, oh, what in the world is this guy doing? And so it, it, was, it was all good. So finally about five minutes later, something happened inside of me. And it was this, are you gonna do what I ask you to do? And are you gonna believe my written word and my spoken word and the prophesied word I've spoke to your heart? So I started praying and then I looked at my wife and my wife is the prettiest woman I've ever seen before in my life. And, and I was looking at her and I just said, God, I really want to get married. And I just got a feeling that if this guy doesn't walk and get healed, that I'm probably not going to get married. Help a brother out. So I get down there, I start praying for this guy. And I have these young people. I said, look, just, just pray. Pray in the spirit. What spirit? And I said, oh, just pray. Say, Jesus, heal this man. They said, Jesus, heal this man. Now what do we say? And I said, just keep saying it. 
please. And so we keep praying. And finally, this guy gets up and he starts walking. He starts walking and then he starts jogging and then he starts running. And then I say, I'm going to get married to the hottest woman in the world. And he starts running around this camp meeting and then he gets in the back and he falls. And I said, marriage off. And then all of a sudden he jumped up and said, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's all right. I just stumbled. And I said, well, keep running. And then I looked at my beautiful bride to be and her mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law were excited. And I said, wedding on, wedding on. So I got excited again. And when I, right before I got ready to speak, the Lord said, now you're going to see a miracle. That's not a miracle. I'm still getting married. That's a miracle. The man ran out of a wheelchair. That's a miracle. I preached a seven minute message on the Holy Spirit. About 35 kids came up in a traditional church that does not believe in the Holy Spirit with the evidence in speaking in tongues. 35 kids started speaking in the Holy Spirit. That's a miracle. The next night, their senior pastor walks up. They said in the pulpit, because he did it on Sunday morning, and said, I don't know what happened last night. But there was a man in a wheelchair, and he ran. 35 kids started speaking in that heavenly language they talk about, Acts. Does anybody else in here want to do that? They said about 20, 25 adults came up. They started speaking in tongues. Okay, now you think that's a cool story. Now here's the next part of it. Somebody about 12 years after that came up and told me that story. Man, remember at this one church, I heard this story that there was this young guy that walked up to preach. And then he said, sir, you're going to walk before I can preach. And then the guy fell and he called him a name. And then he got up and then he finally ran around the church. And then about 35 or 40 people got filled with the spirit. And then the next night, about 25 adults got filled with the Spirit, all because this one young man stood and did what God said. Man, that's an awesome story, isn't it? And I said, oh, man, that's a great story. He said, wouldn't you have loved to have been there? And I said, oh, I bet it would have been awesome. Because the Bible says that our God is a jealous God and he shares his glory with no man. When we are dead to the flesh, when we are living for God, it doesn't matter who gets the glory? It's all about God. And from that moment on, the Lord spoke to my, my spirit and said, you know, I'm always going to take care of you, but never take my glory. Never d be about yourself. Always be about me. I told you what to preach in a traditional church that did not believe in the Holy Spirit, but you spoke it. So kids got filled with the spirit. The next night, adults got filled with the spirit. Some, some dude in a wheelchair took off running. And yes, you still got married. And so God always takes care of you. Amen. The Lord is so extremely good, but God's always looking for, for one person to step up. I'm going to tell you a, a story. I love this story. It's in first Kings 18. It's talking about Elijah. Elijah. Elijah's a man of God. Here's what happened. One day, Elijah, the man of God, and Ahab were talking. Ahab was Jezebel's husband. And man, it was a bad time for Israel's history. But, but there, were, there were people, the Bible says, were faltering between two opinions, Baal and God. And they didn't know the difference. So what happened one day is Ahab and Elisha, the man of God, got together and they said this, we're going we're gonna to have a, a contest. There's 450 prophets of Baal over here and 400 prophets of Asher, that's 850. And over here went in at 191 pounds, one man of God against 850 people. So they're going to have a contest. So what the man of God did is they were going to bring, they were going to bring a bull down one side and a bull down the other. They were going to slaughter them, put them on an altar. And the 850 prophets of Baal and Asher were going to call down fire from heaven. The man of God was going to call down fire from heaven. And which every altar got consumed first, that was the real God. So they got ready to start this competition. And the man of God, being a good Christian, like all of us are, he said, y'all go first. And he gave them all morning to try to call down fire. 850 against one. That's kind of weird odds, isn't it, right? But when the one has the one, he's not a minority, he's the majority, right? So the 850 started going. They slaughtered their bull. Nothing happened. They started cutting their self. They started doing seances and dances and all types of weird stuff. And then noon came and then night came. And the man of God's just sitting over there. And the world's had its time. They tried everything they could and nothing worked. You know, the world is trying everything they can and nothing's working. That's right. So finally, the man of God comes over here and this is what he said. I wish pastors would do this on Facebook. Excuse me, everybody, come here. Everybody in Israel, come here. Come here. Come on. Come on in. I want to show you God. I want to show you the power of God. Do you want to see the power of God? These 850 prophets have been trying, but no fire. And he said, I'll tell you what, go get four, four pots of water. 
build the altar up high. They built the, built the altar up and see what happened. Do you know why he built the altar? Because what the old prophets would do is they would get like, like, like little fire tunnels that would come up under their altar and they would build it. And so whenever they would pray for fire, they would have fire come up. And it was just a scheme. It was maneuvering. It was manipulating to try to make a false fire look like a real fire. So the man of God went over here and he said, we're not going to use any, any iron. We're not going to use anything. We're going to build an old fashioned altar. Watch. And he showed them how they built the altar, slaughtered the bull, got four pots of water. That's not enough. Four more. That's not enough. Four more. Twelve pots of water. And, and they built the altar. Does this make sense? They built the altar so there could be no tricks and no schemes. And then he called everybody together. And this is what... I love about pastors that are on fire on Facebook. They don't put, I've got a good three point message. It's like, if you want to experience the power of God, come to church tomorrow and see signs, wonders, and miracles. And he said, come here, everybody. And he got everybody's attention. And he said, God, sin, fire. And the fire of God came down and consumed everything. And the Dakes Anointed Reference Bible, if you study it out, it said, and God found a man he could trust because there was a man that finally trusted God. Do you trust God with everything that when you come down in a situation in your life that, 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 you, that you can call down fire, that you can stand so boldly? I was in Waterburger the other day and there was this big man, an African-American man that was a lot taller than me and I'm six foot four, he's about six foot six, walked in, but he had a cane. And I said, sir, what's your name? He goes, Samson. I said, I could have prophesied that. And he walked up. I said, I said well, why is your, what's, what's wrong with you? He said, my, my, my back's messed up. I said, I'm going to pray for healing. He goes, what? I said, um, excuse me, sir. Um, I'm going to pray for healing. And he, I said, you know, I got hit by a drunk driver when I was 19. I was never supposed to walk right again. I broke my foot one time. The doctor said, I got to put three screws in it. You'll never walk right again. I said, you know, I haven't had any surgeries, but I've had a lot of prayer. And I said, God can heal you just like he healed me because he's no respecter of person. You know, you got to step out. You got to be bold because when you know God and God, I mean, you just know that God will do what you're going to pray, that you've got such a relationship. See, my kids have such a great relationship with me. They can ask me for anything and I'm going to give it to them. But it's not about asking for things. It's about spending time in his presence. When you spend time in the presence of God, you're going to know God. You're going to know the characteristics of God. You're going to know the things about him because the Bible says that he whispers the secrets of heavens to his friends. You got to be still to hear the whisper. Sometimes you got to stop and slow down and hear what the Lord is saying. Amen. In 2 Samuel 23, 8 and 12, King David, the Bible says, had three mighty men. Let me backtrack. Let me deviate for a second. Um, there was a time that King Saul was going to battle and, and Goliath was coming at him. You know, there was a man there by the name of Shammah that wouldn't fight because he was under King Saul and King Saul was a coward. King Saul tried to do anything in the world, but he wouldn't fight. But there was a time that, that David took over and when David became the king, there was a man named Shama who was a mighty man of valor. In fact, the Bible says that David had three mighty men of valor and I'm gonna tell you about the one named Shama. Shama was instructed one day to go and set in a field of lentils. There's those beans again. To go set in the field of lentils and protect this one field. So this is what Shama did. He went out and got the biggest, strongest men he could, and he built an army to protect this one field. But let me explain what the field of lentils meant. This is what the field meant. The field meant food for their family. And, and the food that they did not eat, they bartered off. They bartered off for donkeys and cattle and hamburgers and whatever else they wanted to barter off for. So they had all of this stuff, and they were to protect this one field. And, and he was told that the Philistines would come and try to, to kill all the men and steal the field. But, but the Lord would give him a victory if he stayed there. So all of a sudden, one day, the Bible says that, that you know, you heard the, 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 ho the hooves of the horses and that they were coming. The Philistines, the Bible says a troop of Philistines were coming in to try to take over the field. And Shammah had all of his mighty men. You know, they looked like gladiators and football players and UFC fighters. And they were all standing in the field. And all of a sudden, everybody took off running. And right then and there, Shama, a fear tried to come in, but he said, you know what? God, you know, God didn't speak to them. God didn't tell David to tell me. He, I was put here, Shama, I was put in this field, not everybody else. They just bought into the vision, but the word came to me, not them. And he said that the Lord would get a victory if I stayed put in this one spot. So the Bible says that when they came over the hill, a whole troop of Philistines came and Shama by himself defeated every one of them. And I love God because after that story, the Bible says, and after Shammah defeated them all and God had the great victory. 
Shaman didn't have a victory. God had a victory. Because when, when you go through something in your life that you could never do by yourself, you know what happens? You stand in God and you stand firm on God's word and, and God's going to get the victory and he's going to get the glory for it. Amen. But, but see, the thing about Shama is he found something worth dying for. He found something worth throwing his life into. He found something that he would completely give everything to. Arthur Wallace said this, find out what God's doing in your generation and in your city and completely throw your life into it. 100% into the things of God. See, there's a story about a man named John Wesley. This is my favorite story to preach. It's not in the Bible. On Sunday, May 5th, John Wesley preached at St. Anne's Church, was kicked out of the church. John Wesley preached May 5th in the PM service at St. John's Church. The deacon said, get out, stay out, you get no honorarium, and don't come back. John Wesley preached May 12th in the AM service at St. Jude's Church, kicked out of there. John Wesley preached May 12th in the PM service at St. George's Church, kicked out of there, no honorarium. Sunday, May 19th, he, he preached at St. Somebody Else's Churches. After the service, had a special board meeting, kicked him out of there. Sunday, May 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. The brother got kicked off the street. Now, that's bad right there. Preached, John Wesley preached May 26th in the AM service out in a meadow, and the owner of the meadow turned a bull out and destroyed the meeting. John Wesley preached June the 2nd in the AM service at the edge of town. He got completely kicked out of town. Now, that's bad. Got kicked out of the town, got kicked off the street, made a bull chase him, running with the bulls. After eight times in a row, on June the 2nd in the PM service, John Wesley preached in a pastor on the outskirts of town and over 10,000 people come to hear what he had to say about the Lord. And they asked him one time after a stadium meeting of 16,000, he said, John Wesley, how come people come to hear you preach? He said, because I set myself on fire. And people just want to come watch me burn. You know, you think about it, how, what burns? Something that's dead. The only thing that's really going to burn is something that's dead. So we die to the flesh and we get ready to come in. If this church is dead to the flesh, it's going to be a, a flame of fire. And people will come in for miles just to watch it burn. This is the last story I'm going to tell. We got any cattle farmer in here? We have any cow, cattle farmers in here? Well, I'm a cattle farmer. My dad's a cattle farmer. We have all... My dad's had cow auction barns my whole life. Well, one day we're at one of our pastures and it's divided into different areas. And all the cattle are on one side and, and the grass was eaten down. And we, my, my dad and I were sitting on this other side. And my dad says, son, look out across that pasture. Isn't it just, it, it's ripe to turn the cattle on. And I looked at the grass. I said, dad, um, the, it's, um, so, uh, dad, it's just solid brown. Cows don't like brown grass. It's It's dead. He said, son, can you not see what is out there? It's solid green. And I said, father, you wear glasses. I don't. It's solid brown grass as far as the eye can see. He said, son, look straight down. So I looked straight down and it was all green grass. But every so often it was just a little bit of brown. But the brown grass stuck up about three inches higher than the green grass. So when I looked out, all I saw was brown, but my father saw what was under the brown. And my dad said this, he got his lighter and he got a cigarette lighter and he lit, he walked to one edge of the pasture and he lit a small fire. Then he walked about five feet and he lit a fire. He walked about five feet and he lit a fire. He walked about five feet and he lit a fire. He walked about five feet and he lit a fire. He said, son, what's coming? I said, the rain. He said, the rain's coming. He said, pick up some grass and let it blow. And then a wind blew behind my back and the wind blew. He said, we're going to light a fire and the wind's going to come in and it's going to blow and it's going to blow, blow the fire. See, what happens is each individual fire is going to burn by itself for a little while. And then when it starts burning for a little while, then the wind's going to catch up behind it and push it. Then all the fires are going to join together and then they're going to burn up all of the dead grass. And then after all of the dead grass is burned, all of a sudden the rain is going to come in and wash it all away. And all that's going to be out there is green grass as far as the eye can see. And it's all going to happen here in just the next few moments. And I said, okay. So my dad lit the fires and all the fires started burning as the wind blew and they all got together and they consumed the pasture. And about an hour later, the rain came in and it washed away. And with one hour, as you looked at everything that looked as if it was dead, was totally green. Do you see where we're going with this? I want each and every person 
that will allow their self tonight to get 100% lit on fire for the power of God to come line up along the front in front of these altars. Because what I'm believing is, hang on for a second. Um, what I'm really believing is this, that every person in here is like one of those little fires. See, what happens is you get lit on fire, you get lit on fire, you get lit on fire. And in your own prayer time, you're going to burn. But then all of a sudden, you're going to come together two or three times a week, and the fire of God is going to be burning. And then when the wind blows through this place tonight, it's going to get all those fires together, and you're going to be meshed together. I'm prophesying this closer than ever before by the power of God. And this church, after this service is over tonight, will be more of a church body and a church unit than ever before. And then after the rain comes in, all the things, see what happens is in your own personal life, there's things that need to be burned away tonight. The only thing that burns is something dead. You know what dead weight is? It's the things that hold you back. It holds you back. It's time for the dead stuff to be burnt away in your life. And then you come together as a family unit and the refreshing rain of the power of God is going to come through this place and this place is going to be changed forever. We turned those cattle loose and they ran upon that field. There is a harvest field out there that is waiting for a church that is on fire because because underneath every every little bit of hay and stubble each and every one of us have inside of our life. There's so much life because the Bible says this in Luke that the kingdom of God is within us, but we're not getting the kingdom of God out of us. It says in Solomon 2 15, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. There's just a few little things in our life that are holding us back. And the thing is, our father says, look deeper. There's so much more in you. My wife always says this, that you walk around and the whole world knows who you are, but you don't even know it because those one or two little minute things that are holding you back. And I'm saying by the spirit of God tonight, there are people in here that can shake a region for God. If you will allow God to burn away just a few little things in your life. Here's a scripture that we're going to close with. This is powerful. See, one day, David is out there tending to the sheep. David's out there tending to the sheep, playing his harp and his ukulele. But see, God had already spoken the word that he was going to be the king, but it hadn't came to pass yet. So what happened is Samuel, the man of God, came in and said, Jesse, Jesse, I want you to bring all your sons and march them before me, and I'm going to anoint one with all. So Jesse went out there and got his best looking son, the biggest and the strongest, robust son he had, and said, here's your king for Israel. The man of God got, got the horn of oil and put it over his head, but the oil wouldn't pour out. He said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse said this. He said, you know what? Let me get my smartest kid. So he brought his, his smart, smartest kid in. And Samuel, the man of God, got the, the oil and poured over his head, but the oil wouldn't come out. And the Lord says, not this one, not this one. The Lord says, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. The man of God was so tuned into the, the things of the Lord. He said, the Lord told me to come in and anoint one of your sons but you haven't sent your son before me that's the rightful king. That's called hearing right there. He said, well, I've got this one more, but you don't want him. You might not want him, but the Lord does. And the Lord brought him in. I don't know why I'm telling this story, but, 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 but the Lord brought him in right there and they anointed him with the and he was the one. There's people in here that you've been rejected and you feel rejected by, by people, but you're not rejected by God. And God is going to choose you tonight. You have been chosen before in the foundation of the world. And I just feel the Lord saying, just remind some people that the worst is that we have like a, we're like a royal priesthood. That God wants to use some people. And there is some shame and some guilt and some condemnation that God wants to completely take away from you tonight. If you will allow him to. So, so, so back to the story. This is what happened. The Bible says, this is in 1 Samuel 16 and 13. So, so, so what Samuel said, he said, Jesse, go get your son. And he marched David in. And it says that so Samuel took, took this, Samuel came in and took the horn of oil and anointed David and anointed him. One translation says a mighty wind came in and changed him forever. Another translation says that the rushing mighty wind came in and took him over. But this is the one I like. It says that when Samuel anointed David with oil, he was vitally empowered from that day forward. From that day forward, he was changed forever because a young man at one Kairos moment in his life said, now is the time that I will answer the call that God has for me. So this is the altar call. I felt like the story with my dad. If people will allow themselves to get catch, caught on fire, now not everybody's going to answer this. And that's cool. 
But you know what? I'm ready for people who are ready to burn for Jesus Christ like ever before. That when you come to an altar, you know what the altar is? It's a place of death and it's a place of life. You know, when you come, you come to get married as an individual, but you leave as a couple. This is what a church family is. We're going from here to here tonight. That this church is going to be connected, one unified body going after a move of God. Amen. So what I want people to do is line up along here that, that you will allow yourself to get caught on fire. We're going to get all like the man of God did and we're going to anoint people tonight and we're going to pray that when the Holy Spirit touches you that you're going to catch on fire the Holy Spirit is going to come through this place and wash every dead thing away amen I'm going to ask the musicians to come if y'all want to do it that way but I'm going to ask people to come line up along the front and I'm going to just we're going to pray for you and believe that you're going to catch on fire like never before and you are going to be vitally empowered from this moment on for the rest of your life so father God I just pray right now Lord that just a moving of your Holy Spirit will come through this place Lord, that people will catch on fire, that people will start to burn for you, Lord. And just like Samuel anointed David and launched him into the destiny that he had, God, that you had already spoken over his life, God, that you would be with them and strengthen them, Lord. And I pray for First Assembly of God, Poe in Arkansas, this church will never be the same after this day, Lord, that this church is going to be one that is known for the spirit of God moving, for the fullness of God, Lord. And also this is going to be a church family that people know they can come they can get love they can get restored and that they can be together as a family unit so father god i just pray for this church right now lord that a mighty outpouring of the holy spirit will happen in each individual's life tonight god I just pray right now that you just start just building yourself up in your most holy faith by speaking in your heavenly language as the bible says so lord i just thank you for this night god i pray that, that things are different lord and this church after this night, Father, say, God, I just pray that you light every person on fire, that they will just be burning for you, God, burning for you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you, Jesus, for each and every person that is here tonight, Lord. Lord God, as each of these individual fires start burning, Lord God, that you will vitally empower them from this day forward, Lord, and they will be changed. Lord, I pray, God, that when we pray together as one corporate family, Lord, that people are healed. God, I pray for people that may not be filled with the Holy Spirit by the heaven of speaking in tongues will be filled tonight, God. They will be completely healed. Lord, I pray for people to be totally restored, God. People will be totally restored tonight, Lord.
Church, let's just press in tonight. You know, like the old timers, they wouldn't pray to the three. That they would pray through. We're not going to pray till we get tired. We're going to pray through tonight. Pray and believe for your breakthrough. Your family is sitting here. We're one fire joined together tonight, God. God, I pray that your fire from heaven will fall upon these people, God, tonight. And that they will never be the same, Lord. Give us a fire inside of us, God, that the world can never put out. The world can never put this fire out, God. Let us burn for you. Let us burn for you with everything that's in our heart, God. Cool city. Some of you need a restoration and in, in, in just praying in the Holy Spirit. Just pray in the Holy Spirit. Just seek the Lord. That's what Jesus told the disciples. Stay in Jerusalem until the Father gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was 10 days they waited. They stayed in the upper room and waited for 10 days until the Holy Spirit comes. Sometimes we won't wait 10 minutes. Just stay in His presence tonight. Believe for your healing tonight. Believe for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and fill you full of His Spirit. If you need the Holy Spirit with evidence speaking in tongues, throw your hands up and just be filled with the Spirit, God. Fill them full of your Spirit.